Welcome to Finite Element Methods. Today, today we'll be discussing the higher order approximation using 1D theory finite elements. And the previous lecture was the first time I introduced finite element analysis as it relates to solving governing equations, because that, what, that, that is what finite elements analysis is trying to do. I can't solve a governing equation over a whole aircraft over a very overly complicated domain just using a hand calculation. I need to find ways to solve the problem and to do that, I have to break up the structure into small pieces and then approximate the solution over those small pieces. And I, what I showed you is that for the linear approximation, the linear interpolation that I used in the very previous lecture using finite elements, there was a discrepancy in the analysis against an analytical solution for a bar that was loaded axially and it had a concentrated load somewhere in between as well. And so how can we improve the solution? One method is to increase the number of elements. Uh, we, we can uh, use that approach. That's called H refinement. And another approach is to potentially increase the polynomial approximation. So last week I used linear approximations to approximate the solution of the partial differential equation. But what we're gonna do now is increase the order of approximation, uh, approximate solution to a quadratic approximation. And you may ask me, hey, why do I need to learn all this stuff? What is the point of this? Bottom line is when you go to industry, you're not gonna be using right rates or weak form lurking, or you're not going to be uh, deriving these uh, solutions. So the natural question may be, why do I need to learn this stuff? And the bottom line is that you actually don't need this knowledge to be able to execute a software. But having this knowledge can be very valuable to try to interpret results. Just today, I saw a solution that didn't make any sense to me. And when I looked at, at, at the solution, I saw stress oscillations that didn't make sense. But understanding the background for why that is can be very helpful. Further, some of you may pursue a research uh, project, which may then require uh, this type of approach. Um, okay, so, um, so we're going to look at a quadratic approximation. Uh, bottom line is that you need to understand the theory if you want to do some research and also to debug some of the results you may see in real life. And that's why you're trying to learn the fundamentals of this, the, the theory behind this stuff. So last week, what we did is the exact solution looks like this. And I use a linear interpolation between the solution. So X is the coordinate, U is the deflection. You can see here approximately this curve with a linear function between two points where U2 and U3 are the nodal deflections of, of interest. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to try to put a piecewise quadratic segment in between. In this, between these two points, I'm going to try to figure out how to do this with a quadratic approximation instead. And it's not a very difficult concept. It's, it's actually the same idea. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take a single element. You can see here a single element with length L with a middle node K. And the nodes of that element are R and J. <coughs> and there are three unknowns, which makes sense. If I have a polynomial that has to satisfy three nodal values, then that means a quadratic polynomial makes sense here. In, in finite elements, a quadratic polynomial means I'm using a second order element. So anytime you use a software, the software asks you, you know, do you wanna use a linear element? Do you wanna use a second order element? And so forth. And so that's what it means with second order elements. I'm using a higher order polynomial to approximate the solution over this domain. Obviously I cannot use a quadratic polynomial to solve a whole aircraft. But if I divide the aircraft into small pieces, small pieces across the whole thing, perhaps I can use a quadratic polynomial over a small element and then solve the problem over the small element, do it for every single element and then assemble the whole thing together. That's the whole idea of finite elements. And so obviously I wanna approximate a solution using quadratic polynomial. And that quadratic polynomial is gonna have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three with the x squared and x multiplied to each of this. And as I said before, we can, we can plug this in into the weak form Galerking and write a Ritz, but that is inconvenient because these alphas have no physical meaning. And I have to have, find a way of connecting this element to adjacent elements. 
that is the point that we're trying to make here. And that is the excitement of finite element methods is that we found and developed a systematic approach of solving complex governing equations using simple polynomials. And that is exciting. So what we have here is that I had this polynomial, but this polynomial has to be valued, uh, has to be equal to ui at xi, has to be equal to uj at xj, has to be equal to uk at xk. And these are the nodal values for this element. <coughs> and this node, this extra node I put in between the elements does not have to be in the middle. It can be anywhere in the middle. If you know there's more gradients occurring here, then you want to move that node to the left. You can do that. That's the powerful thing about finite elements. All the problems we solved so far for the springs and the trusses and the previous lecture did not consider the interior nodes. So this is a new idea, okay? But not entirely new because we've been solving polynomials. We've been solving government equations using polynomials over a domain. And so what I'm going to do then, I'm going to try to figure out a way. Remember, I want my approximation function to be a function of ui, uj, and uk. These alphas have no physical meaning. And I already discussed that it will be more advantageous to have u tilde, this approximation function that goes into the weak form Galerkin. I want that to be a function of ui, uj, uk. And to accomplish that, I'll plug in xi and get ui into this polynomial, xj, I get uj, xj, k, I get uk. I get three equations and three unknowns. What I can do is I can write this into matrix format. <coughs> And so I have this matrix times these coefficients. You can see that the first row times this column gives me the first equation. The second row times this column gives me the second equation. The third row times this column gives me the third equation. Anytime you see a matrix with vectors, do not worry because that's just a bunch of equations. We're just writing it this way so it saves us time. We don't have to write the plus symbol. It really simplifies everything. And in on top of that, when this is coded into the finite element code, you have to use arrays and stuff like that. And so writing plus signs is not convenient. And so then what I have to do is invert this matrix to solve for these alphas. And once I solve for the alphas, which I can do because I can invert this matrix here because I know X, I, X, J, X, K. I know the coordinates of these nodes. I know where they are. So I know it, all of these numbers. These are just numbers. They look like variables here, but these are numbers. I know the location of that node. I know the location of that node, and I know, know the location of this node. So just plug them in here, invert this, and then you get a matrix that can be inverted, multiplied by this, and now I can find alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, which I will have to plug it in here into these coefficients. And the issue is that it's not that simple to put in this format. At the end of the day, what I really want is u tilde x equals ui times something plus uj times, times a basis function plus uk plus uh, times a basis function. Remember, I'm ni, nj, and k are those fees in the right race approximation, weak form Galerkin approximation, but I'm calling them ends for a reason. And in the previous lecture, I discussed how these ends, instead of being called basis functions or trial functions, they're called shape functions because they have shapes. And I showed you that for linear approximation, uh, they look like triangles or ramps. And so once I solve for alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, once I get that, somehow I have to put it in this format. It has to have this coefficient ui that I don't know. I has to have a coefficient uj that I don't know. And it has to have a coefficient uk that I don't know. Somehow this needs to happen. So there's actually a very easy way to do that um, in Mathematica. So once you solve for this, uh, you can then take the derivative of u tilde respect to ui, and Mathematica will speed out ni because none of these has ui, right? So that will go to zero. And so Mathematica will actually automatically give you all these polynomials. Uh, and so here on the left-hand side, just look at what I did here in Mathematica. I inverted a, which is this matrix, and in Mathematica uses the inverse function uh, and then once I do that, I say, okay, 
dotted with UI UJ UK, which is this uh, column vector. Okay, so I get that multiplication going. And um, yeah, so then very next step is to write out the solution. So once I get uh, this multiplication, I get the alphas, uh, basically alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Um, and once I have that, uh, I can take the derivative of u respect to ui of this expression, and it was gonna spit out ni, and then take the derivative of u respect to uj and spits out nj and so forth. It's a little trick that I learned uh, back in the day. One thing you can check is that the shape functions have to add up to one, and I did that here. M1 plus M2 plus M3 is one. Remember, remember <coughs> that the shape functions have to satisfy partition unity. Uh, and that's important because if the bar can move rigid body motion, then I should be able to account for that. And I showed you in the previous lecture that Ni plus Nj plus Nk has to be one for rigid body motion to be able to be simulated. Okay, so I have the unknown coefficients now. I know what Ni, Nj, Nk are. I have a way of finding them. I showed you the blueprint on how to do that. And I encourage you to go to Mathematic and check it out. Although I'm going to show you a faster way, I'm going to show you a faster way of getting these polynomials really quick that does not use Mathematica. But this is the gold standard on how you'll find them, in, in, you know, in a systematic way. So this is beautiful. I have an approximation function that depends on unknown coefficients that are multiplied by corresponding shape functions, right? And now I'm, I can turn this into, I can plug this into my week from Galert and write a Ritz and solve the problem, right? So like I said before, if I add these three uh, shape functions, I get one. So it satisfies partition unity. I'll let you do that at home or just let Mathematica do it. You can see here, I add them up and I got one. And the Kronecker Delta property gets satisfied. Let's, let's check that out. Let me plot each of the shape functions. So. Let, let's pretend that xi is zero, xj is L, and xk is right in the middle, striking center. Uh, so let's plot each of them. Uh, when I actually plug these numbers into here, right, I'm going to get these polynomials. <clears throat> Ni, Nk, and Nj. Ni has this property where it drops like that. Nk goes up maximum at k and drops it to zero. And then Nj goes small here and very high up here to one. So notice how all of them reach one at the node of interest. So Ni reaches a value of one here, but it's zero here and zero here. Remember that the shape function at the location of interest should be one, but it's zero elsewhere. You can see that node k also satisfy that property where is one at not node K, but it's zero elsewhere, beautiful. NJ is also one at node J, but it's also, it's also zero at node K and I, beautiful, right? So that's exactly what we want. We want the shape function to be one exactly where we need it to be. Why is that? Why is that? U tilde at zero, U tilde at zero has to give me ui and therefore this needs to be one everything else has to be zero that's why u tilde at xj has to be uj that's why this needs to be one and everything else has to be zero that's why this works out and that's you know i don't have to be um i don't have to I think physically makes sense. We don't have to uh, um, go any further. Um, now, let's say I don't want to deal with Mathematica. I don't want to. I don't want to derive these shape functions like this. It's, look at this. This is too much work. Look at all the steps I have to do to figure out what the shape functions look like. I have a trick that you can learn on how to get them just by looking at them at the problem. So let, let's look at ni. So hypothetical problem. This value is one. This is six, this is seven. Give me the shape function for Ni without using Mathematica and using all the stuff I just did. Well, let's use a Kronecker Delta property. I know that this shape function has to be zero here at node equals to six. 
And it has to be zero at xj equals to seven. I know that for a fact. This has to be zero at these two places. So therefore, I know my polynomial has to look like x minus six and x minus seven. It has to be. Because x minus six, when I plug in six there, I get zero. When I plug in seven here, I get zero. So it has to be this way. Now, the only thing is that <clears throat> at this node, um, at this point, it has to be one. I know that ni has to be one. So obviously, if I put one minus six and one minus seven, I don't get one. So I had to multiply by some sort of coefficient that when I multiply the whole thing out, I get one. So I can do that fairly easy. You can see here that if I want to get one here for ni at x i equals one, that this has to be one over 30. So the polynomial shape function at node i has to be this much uh, for that node. We can repeat to see for, let's look at, uh, let, let's derive together the shape function for node j, right? So that, that <clears throat> this one has to be zero here and here. Therefore, my polynomial has to be x minus one and x minus six. So, okay, sure. So nj at seven has to be one. So let's plug in seven there. So seven minus one is six, seven minus six is one. So 6c has to be one. So c is one over six. So nj at x has to be x minus one, x minus six divided by six. You can check it. Let's check if this polynomial works. So at x equals one, zero. At x equals six, zero. x equals seven, great, one. It works out. You saw how quickly we derive these shape functions with no problem. Beautifully done. I encourage you to do this at home. You'll be excited that you didn't have to do all these steps, the, the Mathematica you had to do, right? We can do this just by looking at the properties that shape functions have. Secondly, uh, when you're done with NK, let's do one more time. NK, node K, that shape function belongs to node K. That shape function, function has to be zero here and here. So I have X minus one, X minus seven. Beautifully done. Now I have that x equals six. This shape function has to be one at this node. So c is minus one over five, I'm done. And now my approximation function looks like this. And that's beautiful. Now I have a quadratic approximation. And not only that, I have coefficients that are unknown. And these unknowns are the nodal values of my element, which is great because now I can connect I can connect elements to other elements. The only node that does not connect to others is the middle node. That node does not connect to any other element. But that will come out uh, automatically when you do an assembly process. I'll demonstrate that earlier or illustrate that idea. But you know, this is a beautiful idea because you can see here, if I add this ni, nj, and nk, I get one. And it's awesome how this is one here at this node. So that when I plug in x equals one, I get that value, yet is zero for any other nodes. So it's great. I have a way of approximating a solution over domain. Again, partition unity and chronic adult properties are satisfied, which is great. And you can now extend this to, 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 to n equals three, um, n equals four. Uh, <clears throat> the only element in Abacus, Nastran, that has a cubic type polynomial is going to be the order Bernoulli beam element. Uh, the other elements will be either linear or quadratic. There's a few other ones that get more fancy, like the bubble function elements. I'll cover that later. You will see that. So uh, with that said, um, then I have the approximate, the, the, the governing equation for an elastic bar, which is this one. And I showed you already how to derive the weak form of the problem. So you have to multiply this by, this is an error, no V there, but the V goes multiplied by both of these and integrated over the domain. V is the, the weight function, right? And then we integrate by part, part once, uh, and we do that because we can weaken the continuity requirements, which allows us to use the idea of finite elements in the first place. Uh, so that's what we've done here. Uh, again, this V is an error of my, on my end. Uh, but we've integrated our parts. We know how to do that now. Uh, and so we're experts at this process. For you, you're going to plug in 
<coughs> utila and for vegan plugin each of the shape functions and then you'll integrate uh, over the domain so so again uh, to work with fine elements you have to put four things in the format of matrices to make this tractable in any sort of way so the util that can be written in this vector format so the row vector of shift functions n i n k and j and a column vector of unknowns i'm going to call this n bold and i'm going to call this column vector d bold beautifully done look at this u prime i have to take that derivative has occurred so i'll take the derivative the derivative of u respect to x is this quantity here of course this is the only thing that has x so i should take derivatives of each of these shape functions and i'm going to call that b bold this column vector will be called d bold beautiful now i'm going to plug these approximations into my polynomial my weak form of the problem so for the weak form of the problem for equation number one I plug in u tilde. Anywhere I see u tilde, I'll plug in the approximation. So for I have u prime, I have u prime, so that's why you see b bold, d bold. Because I calculated u prime here at the bottom. You can see that there. And you can see here that for v, I chose the first shape function, ni, beautiful, minus p times v, you see that that's ni. N minus pi, and check that out. Uh, let's evaluate pi at node i, xi. That has to be one. This is one at node x equals xi. So that's why there's one, nothing there. <coughs> then I have this one here. And so for this one right here, you can see that I have to plug in u tilde, which is this. And for v, I plug in nk minus p times v, which is nk also. And there is zero, there's no load applied. You don't see any load applied in the middle. A point load, there's no point load applied. So that's, there's zero there. No, no loads like here and here. Uh, for node j, for v, I plug in nj. And u tilde is this. And for v, I plug in nj. And then I get for x equals xj, nj is one because of the Kronecker delta property. Notice how this column vector, this column vector here, made up of ni, nk, and j, you can see that column vector. That column vector isn't that this, but b transpose. It's the same thing as b transpose. So we can put that here as b transpose. This b can go here. And this d bold does not depend on x, so it can go outside of the integral. E a goes inside the integral, although e can be constant. Typically, it's constant. Now, with additive manufacturing, you can get fancy, and you can make modulus vary. That's cool. With additive manufacturing, okay. So we're seeing certain things here that are very powerful that we've been able to achieve, right? And we're able to uh, to do quite a bit here. Right, we're able to figure out ways of approximate a solution to governing equation. So next time when you're working on this, uh, note that with weak form lurking, all we're trying to do, instead of writing one equation at a time, notice that V is just in bold transpose. That's really what it is. You will see that over and over and over that that's exactly what's going on. And now look at this column vector, that's in bold transpose. And then this matrix, this vector of P or the concentrated loads P can go to the right-hand side as well. And you can see that the concentrated loads are PI and zero and PJ because there's no load, concentrated load applied to node K. Beautiful. Um, and any, so, so we can use the right at reach as well and we'll get the same answer by the way. Uh, this is the, the potential energy for a a bar, elastic bar, and U is going to be N bold times D bold. That's what I want to plug in. Now, you can see here that this requires this derivative, uh, and I already showed you how U prime is B bold times D bold. So uh, I can go in and plug that in. 
So I have here, I'm gonna do a little trick. I did it last, last, in the previous lecture, uh, U prime transpose and then U prime here. So this multiply together gives me U prime squared. Um, here for U prime, I get B bold, B bold. And for U, I get B bold, D bold. U is N bold times D bold. And then uh, you, you can see here how this turns out to PJUJ minus PIUI because the shift function is one, but when you evaluate U at XJ, you should get UJ. And when you evaluate U at XI, you should get UI, right? So that's what we got. And so now I have to minimize this equation respect to the deflections D bold. So D bold does not depend on DX. So put it outside of the integral. This D bold goes outside of the integral like that because it does not depend on DX and so forth. The minimization of the total potential energy is given by this. Uh, that I'm going to minimize this. And to do that, I showed you that all you have to do is remove the one half D bold transpose and remove any D bold transpose as well. And once you do that, you arrive to this minimization. Uh, this equation here, B bold times EA, B bold DX, D bold minus that. This equation is the same thing I got with the weak form Galerti. That's the same thing I got here. And isn't that a mathematical miracle? And the reason I consider this a mathematical miracle is because we, one of the ways to do it is to start from a, the Gorman equation. And the, from, from the Gorman equation, we derived, uh, from the Gorman equation, we derived the weak from Galerkin uh, formulation. And then I, completely differently, I started, I started from the potential energy, minimized and got the same answer I got with the weak from Galerkin which is quite exciting. So, so both are equivalent in the way we've done it. Okay. Let's just, let's just dive into some example problems. So example number one is an elastic bar with a middle node K. And I'm gonna use a single element with a load applied to the very end and constrained on the left. So clearly that's an essential boundary condition. The, I'm going to put the node in the middle, right there in the, in the middle. And the first thing I want to do is develop the solution for this problem. I want to solve it. Uh, this is uh, the shape functions I'll get. You can see that these shape functions are great at X equals zero. Uh, I should get one and you see that I do get one. At X equals L half, I get zero and at X equals L, I get zero. And you can check that the rest of them work. You can add them up and you'll get one. So these are great. Um, set of shape functions that do satisfy what we're looking for, which is great. And so uh, I'm gonna go and work the math. So if you remember, let me remind you, uh, I have to take this multiplication, B bold transpose times B. And also notice here in the week from the I also had the same thing, B bold times B. So I had to do that multiplication uh, and I've just done that. So uh, I have these ends, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth. These are the ends I have. I have to take the derivatives of those with respect to X to get B bold, remember, that's what B bold was. So I take those derivatives and then I have to do this multiplication. B bold transpose is this transpose like that. And then B bold is this much. So that, that'll give me a three by three because it's three by one and it's one by three. So I get a three by three. I multiply all that stuff and then I'll integrate it from zero to L. And Mathematica can do that for you or MATLAB or any code you want. When you integrate it, you're gonna get that the stiffness matrix looks like that. Done, that's it. That's how you calculate the stiffness matrix. You can now calculate, so if you look at example number one, I had a distributed load Q and I across the element. So if you recall, the I have this integral now that I had to calculate, Q in bold transpose. So I have to do this integral now. Let's look at that now. I have the integral Q naught of Ni, which is this stuff, and I get Q naught L divided by six and so forth. So just plain in integration, nothing complicated here, very straightforward. Notice how at node I, I get Q naught L divided by six at this point. At node K, I get Q naught L divided by six at this node. In the middle node, I actually get two thirds Q naught L, okay? 
That's what I get there. And notice that when I add, a, add up all these loads, I should get Q naught times L, which is a total load due to that distributed load. So it makes sense they got distributed in that manner. And here you can see the pictorial Q naught L divided by six, two Q naught L divided by three, and Q naught L divided by six. So this adds up to one. You can see that it works out that Q naught times L is exactly what I get. And that's, that makes sense. Let's, let me go back to, you can remember the boundary conditions. I applied a load here on the right-hand side and I fixed it on the left-hand side. So going now that I calculated all, all this stuff, I have this fully calculated, I have this fully calculated, the deflation on the left is zero. So that there's a reaction force as a consequence on that end. U2, sure, there's no load applied, concentrated load. At U3, at the very right, I applied a PL, you can see here. I applied a load at this node. Hmm. And that's where you see a PL there. So now, all you have to do is solve for U2 and U3. Because I have two equations, I can solve for U2 and U3. Once you know U2 and U3, plug it in here, multiply the first row times the column, and that'll give you the reaction force. Example number two, let's do a two element problem. So um, I'm gonna do the same problem now, but I'm going, to, I'm, going, I'm going to divide the domain into two elements, element number one and element number two. And element number one is going to have, uh, I'm gonna put a code number of zero because it doesn't move. So zero, one, two, that's my first element with the interior node here. And I put it on purpose, I put it like off center on purpose. Then for element number two, I've put an interior node somewhere not in the middle, just, 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 just for fun. So element number one and element number two, the previous example was a single element. I'm doing two elements now. And on top of that, I'm making the middle node, well, the node in the interior not to be in the middle of that element. I'm also applying a distributed load Q naught only on element number two with a load applied PL. Hmm. So the code number for element number one is zero one two. The code number for element number two is two three four. So that's gonna help us through the assembly process. Notice how element number one has a length of L. Element number two has a length of three L. So again, that was arbitrarily selected just to illustrate. So we had to calculate the shape functions for each element using these formulas or using the approach I discussed earlier. We want to find an approximation function over each of these elements, over this one, and then also over this one. And I, I, I use the formulas in Mathematica to do it. You can also do it the way I did it earlier. But you can see how I quickly got Ni, Nk, and Nj. We can check it very quick for one of them, so you can see how that works. For node for element number one, that superscript is element number one. Uh, you can see here that Ni gives me one at this node. Hmm. If I set x equals zero, I get L squared divided by the square, I get one. If I plug in an x, a, a value of L third, which is xk equals L third, if I plug it in here, you will see that I'll get zero. So this works out. You can check it and I encourage you to check it. It's going to work out and you will have seen how we've done it. So for element number one, uh, I can go ahead and, and write B bold. Um, so B bold is given here for element number one. I did that in Mathematica by taking the derivative of D of Ni respect to X for each of these, guys, each of these shape functions. We just took the derivative of the shape function with respect to X. You can see that done here in Mathematica. And that's what you see here for B bold. And then I went to Mathematica and say, okay, integrate EA transpose B bold times B and integrate from X equals zero to L and it gave me the whole thing. Look at that beauty. Done. Zero, one, two, zero, one, two is my code numbers. So very simple approach to do this in Mathematica. Very little work.
Hmm. And somehow, I didn't show this, but remember that B bolt was the derivatives of NI, the shift functions like that. And that's what I'm showing here. And I did it here at the, at the bottom in Mathematica. And this integral here is a stiffness matrix. So remember, all I'm doing there, if you forgot, we're integrating this right here. That's what I was doing in that step. And I did it here as well earlier. But I'm letting Mathematica do the work. I don't have to do the work. Mathematica can do it for me. Uh, there's no consistent force vector. I don't, I don't have no distributed force in the element number one, if you recall. So that's zero, there's nothing there. For element number two, same approach, but now element number two goes from L to four L. And so I have to derive the shape function for those. And you can check again that at X equals L, this is one, but at X equals two L, right? So at, at a different X value, in this case is X equals three L, I apologize. Uh, you get this to zero and X equals to four L that gives you zero. So it works out, you can check it. Uh, that it works very good. These are the shape functions for that element. And now again, I let Mathematica do the magic. So B bold is the derivative of N i and K and N j respect to X. And I let Mathematica do the work and I got the B bold matrix. Then integrated E a transpose B bold dot B. Done. That's a stiffness matrix for element number two. The code numbers go up here, two, three, four, two, three, four. Now this one does have a distributed force. If you recall from the problem statement, and if you forgot, forgot, let me show you. Element number two had that distributed load at the top. <clears throat> and so the integral of Q naught in bold T bold, when you do a Mathematica, and you integrate it, you get Q naught L divided by four, three, nine, zero, with the code numbers here written to the right. And just recall how to assemble everything, write the code numbers here for element number one and element number two, and then assemble everything together as you see here on the right. Element number one and element number two. And you know how to search for one, one everywhere, for two, two everywhere and so forth, and then be able to assemble this stuff together. So here you can see how the force vectors can be assembled uh, into this one here. And you can see that the only thing that will get assembled is this number two over here. And that's it, just assemble it. Notice how the concentrated force was zero, zero, zero in PL here because there was no force applied in the very, in those, in those, let me show you again in case you forgot. No, I actually have it here, I apologize. So I have a force applied just here on node number four. That's why you see that there. No forces applied on three, two, and one, and that's why those are zero. And that concludes the example for the, the elastic bar. So I thank you for, for listening to listening to this for